Hello again, and welcome to A Little Book Open. We're studying the wonderful book of Daniel in the Old Testament. Not the largest of books, but packed with information and relevance for us today who live in this century. We're going to pray as we begin and have a short review and then launch into our study. Pray with me. Father in heaven, thank you for giving the message of your love through Daniel, for preserving that message in the Holy Scriptures through the centuries despite Satan's attacks, and for now uh, making it available to us. And Lord, as we open your word now, we pray that you will open our eyes, open our minds and our hearts so that we can perceive what it is that you want to teach us. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks again for joining us today on Loma Linda Broadcasting Network. I'm Pastor John Anderson. We're continuing our study in the book of Daniel. We're looking now at Satan's 10-point strategy to bring destruction to Daniel and his friends and how that applies to you and me today. Because Satan is a strategist. He is a military general. There is a battle that is going on. And we are helpless on our own because Satan has much higher intelligence, much greater experience. But if we remain faithful to God and walk in obedience to his light, angels will protect us and we can survive through this ordeal called planet Earth. God has a plan as well. We'll be taking a look at that a little bit later. Satan has a 10-point plan we're looking at now. God has a 10-point plan for our salvation. And if we will accept him and follow him, let him lead us, he will put his plan into operation in our lives, and he will come back someday soon to take us to heaven, where we can meet all these great people like Daniel and his friends. So where we left it last time, uh, is that we're looking at the different points of Satan's strategy as they are brought to view in this first chapter of the book of Daniel. The city of Jerusalem was besieged and battered and captured. And then Daniel and his friends were brought to Babylon and some of the articles or vessels from the temple were also brought and put on display in the temple museum. We studied about that and the significance of that and that we don't want to be in Satan's museum. We want to be in God's museum, being, uh, being there to display his grace and his love. The fifth point, which is where we are right now, is that when Daniel and his friends were brought into Babylon, they were placed under the care of someone named Ashpenaz, who is giving the, given the shocking title of the master of the eunuchs. And we don't have to read between the lines to know what that means. As a matter of fact, we read in the book of Isaiah a specific prophecy that predicted that the day would come when this very tragic event would happen. So Daniel and his friends are brought into the court of Babylon. They're made eunuchs. That was done commonly back then. Anybody that served in close proximity to the royal family was treated that way so there'd be no question as to who the father of, of the uh, new uh, baby would be that was born to, the, born to the queen. We took a look at how the lives of the prophets illustrated the, uh, the love story, the tragic love story that the Lord is going through. Daniel was made a eunuch. Uh, Jeremiah was not even allowed to marry. Ezekiel's wife passed away very quickly. Uh, Hosea was told to marry a harlot. All these were pictures of how God's heart is broken and crushed. Those very words are in the Bible. Ezekiel 6, 9, my heart, it, it says that he was crushed by their idolatry. And in Jeremiah 23, 9, my heart within me is broken. I don't know if you've ever gone through an experience like that when uh, you've fallen in love with somebody and, and you've... Uh, uh, made that decision to commit to them, and yet your love is rejected, spurned, betrayed. Your heart is broken. You feel crushed. That's an indication of what the Lord has felt by the waywardness, the transgressions of his people. So this matter of, of uh, Daniel becoming a eunuch plays a role in helping to understand this great controversy, this battle that's going on. So what we want to do now is continue that idea of study into the spiritual significance of this sad event, to see, see it in a broader light. Let me ask you a question as we begin. What was the very first command that was given to Adam and Eve? The very first command. Was it, don't eat the fruit of the forbidden tree? No. Was it, honor of the Sabbath, the first full day of their existence? No, that was not the first command. The very first command that was given, given to Adam and Eve, we find in Genesis 1:28. Now, Genesis 1.28 is only a couple of verses after God announced his plan. Let us make man in our image. And then he did make man in his image and his likeness. And now we read these words from Genesis 1, verse 28. Be fruitful and multiply. 
It was God's purpose that through Adam and Eve, through their marriage, they would have many children, their children would have more children, and the earth would be populated. The family of, of humanity would grow and expand. And they were given that command, be fruitful and multiply. The very first command given to Adam and to Eve. With that in mind, and with your spiritual eyeglasses in place, consider now another beginning point. Not the beginning point that Genesis is talking about, but the beginning point of God's church in the New Testament. How was it that Adam came into existence, and what happened to bring the New Testament church into existence? How do they compare? Well, we read in Genesis 2, verse 7, the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living being. So that's how man came into being in the beginning, the story of Genesis. The body in a literal sense. Now let's think about the body in a spiritual sense. You know the New Testament church is called the body of Christ many times. How did the body of the church come into existence? And how does that compare with what we just read in Genesis? Well, when we turn to the book of John, chapter 20, we find that after Jesus' resurrection, he met with the disciples, and this is what he said. John 20, verse 22. It says, he, that is Jesus, he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. So I invite you to consider that event described there in John 20 as it relates to Genesis 2. How did Adam come into being? It says the Lord breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. He became a living being. How did the body of the New Testament church come into being? It was virtually by the same means. He breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. What Jesus said in anticipation, he later repeated in the book of Acts, chapter 1, verse 8. Jesus said, you, he's speaking to his believers, the nucleus of what would become the New Testament church, the body of believers, you shall receive power, or you could say you will come alive, when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be witnesses to me in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the ends of the earth. So putting these two ideas together side by side, we find that Jesus told him in John chapter 20, verse 22. He breathed on them and said, receive the Spirit. In Acts 1, he's repeating that same idea and says, you will receive power or life when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you will be witnesses. What was the purpose for Adam and Eve to come into existence? What was, what was their role, their job? The first commandment, be fruitful and multiply. Expand the family. Grow the family of humanity. What was the purpose of the body of Christ, the New Testament believers, it was by receiving the Holy Spirit, they were to be witnesses, which would result in the kingdom growing, the family growing. So what happened in Genesis 2, in a literal way, with regard to the body of Adam, physically, is also an illustration of what God intended the New Testament body, the New Testament church to be. Through the indwelling, uh, life-giving power of the Holy Spirit, they could be witnesses and the family would grow. The kingdom would expand. Same idea in a spiritual way. In Acts 1, verse 8, it uses a verb that turns our attention to another event that was also a very special beginning. And I'm drawing your attention now to the verb that is used there when it says, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. When the Holy Spirit has come upon you. Do you know that that verb, that phrase, is exactly the same as what Gabriel told Mary when she was about to become pregnant with the Christ child. Gabriel said, the Holy Spirit will come upon you. Power of the highest will overshadow you. And of course, that resulted in the birth of Christ. That same power, we're speaking very reverently, very delicately here, but that same power that allowed Mary to become pregnant and give birth to Christ, that same power would come upon the believers and bring life and uh, they would become Christians, followers of, of Jesus, disciples of Jesus, for the purpose of expanding the kingdom, growing the family, just like Adam back in Genesis chapter 1 and 2. So that was the reason for their 
uh, coming to existence. Jesus referred to this in what we call the Great Commission. Matthew chapter 28, verse 19. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. That was the purpose of the church, to, to grow the kingdom, to expand the family of God in that sense. So, if I can engage your mind here for a minute, think about the comparison. In Genesis, the command is be fruitful and multiply. In the New Testament, the command is, we call it the Great Commission, go and make disciples. They're essentially the same command. One is in the physical dimension, the other is in the spiritual dimension, but they're saying the same thing. You could say, if you wish, that what the Lord told Adam and Eve in the beginning was the Great Commission. Or you could say that what was given to the New Testament church was the command, be fruitful and multiply. Basically the same thing, only one physical, literal, and the other spiritual. But that was God's intent. Through the divinely given capacity to procreate, they were to expand the family of God. What is Satan's purpose? To stop that, of course. To bring that to a halt. To hinder it in whatever way he can. To make of God's people spiritual eunuchs. Daniel experienced that in the literal sense when he was taken to, to Babylon and placed under the care of Ashpenaz. But what Satan wants, part of his 10-point plan, is to make God's people spiritual eunuchs so that the kingdom doesn't expand. The word is not given out. Now we find that there are some examples in the Bible that illustrate this. Sad to say. Opportunities for witnessing, for sharing, to cause the family to grow that were neglected or spurned. We came upon one already, uh, but it plays a vital part in the story right here. We read about Hezekiah, how he got sick. He prayed. The Lord answered his prayer and said as a token of his uh, miraculous healing, the sundial was going to turn back 10 degrees. Well, those that were observers of the movements of the heavens saw that. They, they could see that something had happened. Where can we find out about this? Who knows about this? Ah, maybe the Hebrew, maybe the Hebrews can tell us what this means. So they sent uh, ambassadors to Jerusalem to find out uh, what, what is the cause of this. What an opportunity for Hezekiah to share, them, share with them the knowledge of the true God, the God who controls nature and brings healing to us and wants to be your God as well. But what did he say instead? Instead of taking advantage of that opportunity, the Bible says that he showed them all the treasures of his house. And that's when Isaiah said to him, sad to say, they're going to come and take all the treasures and your sons and grandsons and descendants will become eunuchs in the palace of Babylon. On that day, Hezekiah became himself a spiritual eunuch. He failed to exercise the opportunity to have the family of God grow by witnessing uh, to God's love and God's power. How sad. Now, the good, the good news is, let's not misunderstand, we've all, we've all experienced that defeat when opportunities have come and we've not taken advantage of them. I can tell you personally, I look back and I see where there are opportunities like Hezekiah had and I didn't rise to the occasion. I confess my sin before God that I didn't do what I should have done. But God is forgiving. What we want to do now is start from here and do better. But Hezekiah... Uh, neglected an opportunity. He was, in effect, a spiritual eunuch. He did not cause the family to grow. Jonah uh, went down that path. The Lord said, I want to send you to Nineveh. There are people there that will respond to my message if you just go and tell them about me. Where did Jonah go? Well, he fled down to Joppa and got in a boat and was going to go the opposite direction. Jonah became a spiritual eunuch that day. Now, of course, we know how the story changed and Jonah eventually went to Nineveh and the people did repent of their sins. But at that moment... He neglected the opportunity. And the same we can say regarding the Apostle Peter. The Apostle Peter followed Jesus for something like three years. Jesus told him what was going to happen. He was going to be taken. He was going to be crucified. And Peter, what did he say? Oh, no, that, that can't happen. Jesus said, all of you are going to forsake me and flee. And Peter, what did he do? No, that'll never happen. Why, even if, my, if it costs me my life, why, I will not forsake you. And what did Jesus say? He said, before the rooster crows two times, you will have denied me three times. So what happened was that they went out to the garden to pray. Jesus prayed a short distance from where Peter, James, and John were. When Jesus came back, he found them asleep and said, 
Uh, can't you just watch with me one hour? Watch and pray lest you enter into temptation. That was Peter's opportunity to feed his soul through prayer so that he could be strengthened that when the crisis came, he could stand up for Jesus. But instead, his eyes became heavy with sleep and he neglected that opportunity to pray three different times. So it was that when Jesus was arrested and he was taken to the, uh, the home of Caiaphas, Peter was recognized. And uh, a different one said, well, you must be one of, one of them. Your speech betrays you. Your accent tells, you that, tells us that you're a Galilean. What was Peter's response in all those situations? He denied his Lord. I don't even know the man, he said. At that moment, Peter became a spiritual eunuch. There was an opportunity for him to share. He could have stood tall. He could have said, I am a follower of Jesus. He is the true Messiah. He's the coming one that the prophets have told us about. What you're doing is wrong. He is, he is nothing worthy of the nothing worthy of, of uh, you arrested. But instead, he cowered in fear. He was warming his hands by the fire there. And he, he failed to live out the opportunity to be a witness for God. That's what the devil wants to do with us. He wants to make us spiritual eunuchs, either through laziness or neglect of the study of the word so we don't have anything to share, or for whatever reason, when an opportunity comes to tell others about Christ, we don't take advantage of the moment. We become spiritual eunuchs. Let's not let that happen. Let's be faithful to the Lord and, and uh, take advantage of those opportunities to share about God and his plan and his love so that others can be part of his family, and can be saved eternally in the kingdom. That's our purpose here. We are here to be fruitful and multiply. That was number five. The devil had a 10-point plan in chapter one of Daniel. And uh, we've talked about how he besieged, he battered, he took captive, he put on display, and he neutralized. Now point number six and seven kind of go together. And it has to do with food and drink. We're going to read from the Bible now. And we're going to read from... Chapter 1 of Daniel, and I'm going to start with, uh, I'll start with verse 3 just to give the complete context. Daniel 1, verse 3. The king instructed Ashpenaz, master of the eunuchs, to bring some of the children of Israel and some of the king's descendants and some of the nobles, young men in whom there was no blemish, but good-looking, gifted in all wisdom, possessing knowledge and quick to understand, who had ability to serve in the king's palace, and whom they might teach the language and literature of the Chaldeans. And the king appointed for them a daily provision of the king's delicacies and of the wine which he drank, and three years of training for them so that at the end of the time they might serve before the king. Now, from among those of the sons of Judah were Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. To them the chief of the eunuchs gave names. He gave Dan Daniel the name Belteshazzar. To Hananiah, Shadrach. To Mishael, Meshach. And to Azariah, Abednego. We'll talk about the names and their significances a little bit later. But we're thinking about the matter of the food and drink. And verse 8 says, Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with the portion of the king's delicacies, nor with the wine which he drank. Therefore, he requested of the chief of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself. So Daniel and his companions are taken to Babylon. And even though some terrible things happen, uh, it seems that Nebuchadnezzar wanted to uh, show them some favor. And so he arranged it so that as they came to eat at the table, the food that was brought to them was actually going to come from the king's private kitchen, from his personal chef, uh, from his treasured wine cellar. These that were going to be serving in the court of Babylon were going to be given the food and the drink of Babylon. And I'm, I feel quite certain that Nebuchadnezzar meant that as a token of, of goodwill uh, shown toward these that he had taken captive. But Daniel saw immediately that there was a problem here. With respect to the food, which we'll talk about first, and with respect to the drink, there was an issue that he, as a God-fearing Hebrew, uh, could not violate his conscience on these things. The food, let's think about first. Now, we're not told explicitly what it says constituted the menu there that they served, but we can be quite certain that uh, it contained food that would have been on the, um, the no-eat list from uh, Leviticus, what we call Leviticus 11 or Deuteronomy 14. 
God had made a distinction between clean and unclean foods, which goes all the way back to the story of Genesis. Now, it is uh, described and delineated in the Levitical laws, Leviticus 11, Deuteronomy 14. But we know that that distinction existed long before that because when the animals went to the ark, we're told that the unclean went in two by two, the clean animals went in seven by seven. The Lord, when he created Adam and Eve, gave them a very, very good diet. We're told about that in Genesis 1, verse 29. Basically, it was a diet of, of fruits and grapes and nuts, seeds, and uh, the, the health of the body would flourish with that type of diet. It did not take long before fallen humanity, after sin, began to eat the, the uh, flesh food of, of animals. But that was not God's original diet. When the flood came, and now vegetation has been removed from the earth, basically, because of the flood, and there wouldn't be as much of that yet, the Lord allowed the, meeting of, the eating of meat, but with certain restrictions. It would have to be only food from the clean class of animals, which uh, Daniel was well aware of what that constituted, and it had to be slaughtered or killed in a specific way. Now, we know that this, this guideline existed all throughout the Old Testament and was preserved into the New Testament era, era. If you read Acts chapter 15, you'll find very clearly that as the church was expanding into Gentile areas, people that weren't as well acquainted with the Jewish heritage, that nevertheless they were expected to, to eat the food that was on the clean list and killed in the proper manner. It says that they were to restrain from eating animals that were strangled. When you strangle an animal, the blood remains in its body. And science tells us today that it's the blood that carries the objectionable toxins and uh, uh, bring harm to our body. So back then, if, if flesh food, if meat was to be consumed, it had to be from the clean list of animals, and it had to be slaughtered in the proper way. That is, it had to be uh, slaughtered in a way that the animal would bleed out, and almost all of the blood would be pumped out to uh, bring about the animal's death. Daniel knew that, and he also knew that what was going to be served on the table there would not conform to those guidelines. So there was a problem. Not only the, the uh, type of food itself, but no doubt the way it was prepared, Daniel could see that there was a problem there. Now it's called in the Bible his delicacies. So I'm sure that uh, the bakers, the cooks there in the uh, royal kitchen uh, used a lot of the things that human bodies like. Salt and grease. Salt and grease. And uh, as Daniel looked at it, he could see that those things probably baptized and Grease and sprinkled with salt uh, just wouldn't be very healthy. Now, the, the other objectionable item was that these foods were, uh, without doubt, blessed, thought to be blessed by heathen deities before they were put out to eat. Food offered to idols was something that was very common in Old Testament times and into the New Testament era. It is an issue that Paul addresses on numerous occasions. For Daniel, in that particular context, to eat that food that would be unclean, not kosherly slaughtered, would be prepared in a way that would be unhealthy, and was no doubt food that had been blessed by one of the heathen Babylonian deities, he knew would be the wrong thing to do. So it says in Daniel 1 verse 8, Daniel purposed in his heart, even before, probably even before he got there, anticipating what might happen. Daniel had made up his mind what does purpose in your heart mean? It means to make a decision, to resolve, to make a commitment toward. He made this decision that he would not eat that food. It wasn't good for him. It would violate his conscience. It would disappoint the Lord whom he served. And so no matter what the cost, Daniel was going to bring up this as an issue. So what does it say there? He requested of the chief of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself. He made a very simple request. As you read through the chapter, he said, let us be given water and vegetables, simple food, uh, simply prepared. And uh, as you read through the story, you find that uh, because Daniel had been so courteous and so winsome, that request was granted. They were given a 10-day test, and they were shown to be healthier uh, in appearance and uh, more intellectually uh, in tune than the other candidates that were taking that 
that class. And so Daniel and his friends were allowed to stay on that diet uh, throughout their time there. So, food. We're thinking about it in the physical sense, of course, and there is relevance there today. Uh, the food of the Western diet, can we just speak plainly, for the most part, is not very healthy. It also comes from food that is not kosher, is not from the clean list, is prepared in a way that, that contains a lot of grease and salt. It's not good for our bodies. What the Lord would have us do would be concentrate on a more simple, a healthier uh, diet. And we would benefit. Science confirms that today. We know that to be the, to be the truth of it. The simple thing is that, that life flourishes when the bloodstream is clear. And when the pipes become constricted through the depositing of plaque and cholesterol, it limits the amount of blood that can be pumped through and causes high blood pressure and all these bad effects. We know that. That's, that's uh, undisputed. And those things that that cause the deposition of the cholesterol and the plaque and so on, are things that come from the food that God said, stay away from. Eat simple and you'll be benefited. Uh, have you heard of God's eight doctors? Now, we, we recognize the role of modern medicine and we thank God for the information, for the techniques, the procedures, the medicines that are available today. But laying that aside for a minute, the Lord would have us live in a way that prevents disease to a large degree. And so there are eight doctors we can say that as we close our discussion today, I'll introduce you and then in our next session we'll talk a little bit more about it. But what are the eight doctors? Nutrition, that is healthy diet. Exercise, water, sunshine, temperance, fresh air, rest, trust in God. Now if you take those eight words that I just gave you and take the first letter of each of those eight words, you will find that the word new start is formed by uh, that anagram. And that is a very, very helpful way, healthy, healthy way to live. As we continue our study next time into the role of the food and the drink that was offered to Daniel, keep in mind that this has very, very important relevance to us today. As God is seeking to wrap up this great controversy, this battle between Satan and Christ. He wants people that have healthy minds and healthy bodies. Minds are not clouded by, by uh, uh, intoxication or other things that would inhibit our ability to think. Bodies that are strong, as strong as we can be. And God can make it so if we will place ourselves under his keeping. Let's pray. Lord, we pray that your will will be fulfilled in our lives. And even though we may be tempted by the delicacies of Babylon today, either in food or in spiritual application. Lord, we pray that we'll have the resolve, the decision of Daniel to refrain and to honor you in all things. In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs>